to another edition of uh, uh, a webinar from Marcellus on our flagship portfolio, the Consistent Compounders. Um, as many of you would know, uh, the last 18 months have been uh, a difficult period as far as portfolio performance is concerned. Uh, we have talked about it consistently through this period, the way we see it. Um, and today's webinar uh, is another uh, occasion for us to um, a talk about how we see this uh, performance um, as, as reflected in the thoughts by our fund manager Rakshit in, a, in his recent newsletter on optical illusions. But also more importantly, we'll talk about the fundamentals of the companies in the portfolio, uh, how they are panning out as, uh, as we see it. So to take us through that over the next uh, 45 minutes or so, we have Rakshit Ranjan, uh, the fund manager of uh, Consistent Compounders and his colleague uh, Devin Kulkarni. Um, post which we will take uh, questions. Uh, so you can start typing in your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we'll take as many as possible uh, until 6.30. So over to you, Rakshit. Thanks, Pramod. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, um, and welcome to the webinar. Um, welcome to the uh, CCB webinar. Uh, so as Pramod mentioned, let's, uh, let's dig straight into the fundamentals first, and then we'll talk about a few concepts on how to interpret, understand fundamentals, share price performance, portfolio performance, et cetera, um, which links it to the optical illusion part as well. Um, so to begin with, um, uh, we are through with the end of fourth quarter FY23. Um, few companies have uh, reported uh, 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 some top line numbers uh, for the quarter gone by. Uh, most companies are yet to report uh, anything by way of uh, top line or bottom line. Uh, but here are the few that have reported so far. So I'll cover a few and I'll pass it on to the Devin uh, uh, for, for, for the rest. Uh, um, so Bajaj Finance, uh, uh, one of our top positions, uh, it's an NBFC. Um, uh, they reported uh, uh, having acquired new customers way more than what they had guided at the beginning of the year for FY23. They ended at, uh, at about 20% higher than their guidance uh, for FY23, which is encouraging. Um, this translates into a quarterly uh, uh, momentum, which has been at all time high levels. It's about 40% year on year growth for their quarterly uh, new customer additions. Um, and uh, that as a result has led to their um, loan book, which is AUM loan book uh, uh, also growing at a very healthy pace of about 29% year on year. Um, and, uh, and the most interesting part was that for the quarter uh, gone by, uh, deposits grew by about 45%. And uh, remember, deposit growth being very healthy is, uh, is way more crucial in times like this uh, when, uh, when for most lenders, uh, ability to garner deposits uh, uh, is uh, is becoming the, the the sort of separation factor between the men and the boys in the industry. So that's Bajaj Finance, pretty encouraging. And as we've been talking about how we see this business, it's evolving from being just a lender to becoming a fintech player, where profit after tax per customer acquired is growing at about ten percent plus compared to loan book per customer acquired um, on their cross sell upsell customer portfolio itself. Um, moving on to HDFC Bank, another large position in our consistent compounders fund, uh, where loan book growth was healthy. Uh, the, uh, at, at, at a gross level, it was 21% year on year, which is a very healthy run rate. Um, and uh, that was backed by deposit growth, which was also exceptionally strong, uh, roughly twice as much as the uh, overall system level deposit growth for the banking industry uh, at 21%. Um, again, uh, this, is, uh, this is one very big factor to remember for the coming few quarters that will separate, separate the men for, from the boys in the banking industry. Um, and, and that's where we, are, we think HDFC Bank is demonstrating uh, a significant strength uh, uh, in its fundamentals. Uh, HDFC Life, uh, uh, many of you might have been a little worried about uh, uh, the outcome uh, of this investment after what the government announced. Uh, we did uh, quantify in the last couple of webinars and newsletters, um, particularly our colleague Tej uh, in his uh, uh, KCP communication has highlighted uh, uh, that even in the worst case scenario, the impact of budgetary announcements is uh, uh, relatively limited. And uh, on top of it, what you can see 
from Jan, Feb, uh, monthly data points for the overall industry. Um, HDFC Life uh, has actually got, uh, uh, gained significant market share. So I'm encircling the relevant part uh, um, for, uh, for you to be on the same, uh, same page as I am. Uh, so 17% year on year growth for HDFC Life versus actually no growth for the industry. That's the that's Jan and Feb um, uh, progression for HDFC Life. Uh, ICICI Lombard again had a very healthy 4Q and, uh, and, and full year. Obviously, there was uh, there's there's some optical aspect to uh, uh, to the income growth uh, because of a temporary factor. Uh, uh, if you leave that aside, then in fact the 17% year-on-year growth for FY23 will become an even healthier number. Um, and uh, Titan, uh, one of our largest positions in CCP, uh, reported a, a, a fantastic uh, top-line growth for the fourth quarter. Devin, you want to talk about it? Yeah. So uh, Titan uh, continues to deliver fundamentals as per our expectations or even higher than our expectations in some divisions like Carrot Lane. So uh, in, the, in the recently uh, ended quarter, uh, uh, they reported a growth of 25% YOI. Although this growth is on a low base of last year because Jan to Feb last year, there was a Omicron-led COVID wave uh, in India. But even if we step back and look at the performance over a four-year period, uh, the revenues have compounded at a very healthy rate of 18%. Uh, and this, this is 18% is just a uh, jewelry segment. If we look at the overall performance, uh, it has grown at uh, a very healthy rate of 21%. Uh, and ma major part of this growth is driven by Tanishq, which happens to be the, uh, the core business. Uh, coming to the smaller businesses or divisions, uh, so Carrot Lane continues to surprise us quarter after quarter. It has delivered another quarter of uh, a very healthy 56% year-on-year growth. And the even more impressive part is that uh, the studded mix of Carrot Lane has improved compared to previous year, which is likely to benefit in, uh, result in better profitability. So studded mix is basically the mix of diamond studded jewelry uh, in total sales. And because diamonds have higher margins, uh, the better mix results to improvement in profitability. Uh, watches division uh, has been an astonishing one for this quarter. Uh, so watches reported a 41% year-on-year growth uh, in Q4. Uh, even if we look at the performance over a four-year period, uh, the growth is 14%, which is very exceptional for a category like uh, watches. Uh, in our internal estimates, although we don't assign a very material fair value to this division because we ourselves are not convinced about the growth potential in watches, uh, the management has set a very ambitious target of uh, uh, doubling the sales in the next three years. Uh, and a major part of that uh, target, uh, the management expects, will be achieved by wearables, uh, which is the fit, uh, fitness bands and smartwatches. Uh, in that context, uh, they, they recently hired a chief operating officer in the US uh, who has a very long uh, history uh, of founding startups uh, in the wearable space. Uh, and as his last job, he used to head a wearables division in, in Philips. So a very senior hire to focus on uh, wearables, and if they deliver on watches, it will be a it will be a positive surprise to our expectations. Eyewear, uh, as as we have discussed, the model has been fixed. They have consolidated the supply chain. They have corrected the retail format. Has delivered a healthy growth of 22 percent uh, year on year. And finally, coming to Tanaira, which is the sari retail business of uh, of Titan, it's still in the incubation phase. In the last quarter, this business has doubled its revenue, largely uh, largely led by store additions. Great, thanks, Devin. Uh, so those are the results reported for the fourth quarter so far. Um, how does that translate into the bigger picture for the overall portfolio? This slide gives you um, uh, an update on that. So um, in the table on the top, you can see how the portfolio level Revenue growth and earnings growth have uh, uh, progressed in FY23. Nine months, uh, 23 is uh, is the nine months ending 31st December. As I said, uh, 31st March numbers for FY23 aren't yet fully out. So we are talking about nine months in this uh, context. Um, it's a healthy 20 to 25% uh, revenue growth and earnings growth on a base of, uh, of a pretty healthy uh, uh, revenue and earnings growth for the 
for the financial year FY22 as well, right? So, so FY22 was not weak by any standards, uh, although it was benefited a little bit by a slightly low base uh, in FY21 because of the COVID disruptions. But on a relatively more normal base of FY22, nine-month FY23 delivering a 20 to 24% is, uh, is pretty encouraging. So that's, uh, that's how we see uh, fundamentals progress in the more recent past. Uh, going forward, in fact, don't forget, uh, uh, we've talked about how capital intensity, capital investment intensity, capex intensity had uh, spiked upwards in FY22 for our portfolio. Uh, this included a battery of acquisitions across the portfolio, a lot of tech investments uh, uh, and, uh, and lots of uh, uh, sort of initiatives too improve asset turns, compress working capital cycles, add new revenue growth drivers, disrupt radically the, the entire industry of the, of the uh, 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 business in which these companies operate. Um, all of those initiatives are, uh, are only beginning to fire in FY23. You'll see a much bigger impact of these uh, CAPEX acceleration initiatives in FY24 and 25. So watch out for that. Um, when you look at the bigger picture, the longer pic longer term picture uh, is the table at the bottom. Um, so a, a few uh, few points to remember here. Um, as we uh, uh, promised to to our clients, um, we aim to build a portfolio where the quality of the portfolio, the pricing power of the portfolio, uh, is expected to be significantly higher than uh, than average, and it's expected to be uh, right on top. Um, if you were to if you were to rank uh, most of the listed stocks uh, in the in in the relevant area of the stock market, that's exactly what we've delivered. Uh, so so when you look at the returns on capital employed and compare that to let's say Nifty 50's returns on capital employed, there's a very healthy 20% gap sustained uh, year on year, pretty much every year uh, between these two uh, uh, these two uh, 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 numbers. That's also uh, then subsequently reflected by our capital reinvestment uh, and hence growth of profit after tax and free cash flows for our portfolio companies versus uh, the Nifty 50, where again, you see a very healthy five to 10% gap for any five year rolling period on average about nine percentage points gap historically. And we expect these uh, these quantums of gap in return on capital employed and return on profit after tax growth to continue um, into the long term future as well. Um, uh, and uh, and and that's exactly where it'll be interesting to see how the how the uh, impact of uh, the last three years of uh, accelerated investments during a crisis will be visible through through fundamental growth acceleration going forward for this portfolio. Um, that's what has happened to valuations. On the other hand, whilst uh, in FY23, uh, uh, free cash flows of uh, these portfolio companies uh, over the last six, seven, eight years would have been seen going up at a very steady pace, which is the solid line. The dotted line, which is the share price performance, uh, saw a massive downward uh, dip in terms of the price to free cash flow multiple. Uh, because of the disconnect emerging between fundamentals and share prices, right? So this vertical line is where obviously we don't have the reported free cash flow numbers for FY23 yet, but uh, when they do get reported, um, highly, like, highly likely you will see the solid line uh, uh, going up uh, with, a, with a higher slope than historical, um, whereas the dotted line has gone down. And that jaw opening, every time it has happened, has been followed by a massive recovery in the dotted line to catch up with the solid line. And that, uh, that catch up of the dotted line with the solid line effectively is what we are looking forward to um, in the coming months and quarters, uh, which, uh, which is a disconnect that can't sustain uh, for too long, uh, but does sustain every once in a while uh, for shorter periods of time. Um, so that's uh, that's on fundamentals versus valuation and the disconnect. Um, in terms of uh, how do you uh, then link all of this in terms of understanding, uh, we thought of first uh, 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 sort of talking about a, a few uh, a few optical illusions that occur in our mind, build a template, and then take you through some of these optical illusions as they've played out in front of us over the last uh, three, five, seven years. 
uh, for investments in equities. Um, so here's a here's a sort of setting the context uh, on the subject of optical illusion. Um, um, for those of you who've uh, who've been uh, reading the works of uh, Daniel Kahneman, uh, would uh, would probably be very familiar with this. Um, he actually uh, described in his book Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, two types of uh, uh, thinking mechanisms that human mind has. Uh, the first one is sort of, you can call it a knee-jerk reaction. It's instinctive, it's quick decision, uh, bases, uh, bases the inputs that you receive. And the second one is far more analytical, deeper, uh, 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 deeper dive before you come out with your conclusion and your decision. Uh, so the first one, the instinctive one, he calls it system one, and uh, the more analytical one calls it system two. And there are some very commonly found examples from our day-to-day -day life that he cited in the book. Uh, for instance, if you're trying to fill out, uh, uh, fill out a, a tax form, if you're trying to um, uh, 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 sort of uh, check the validity of a mathematical argument, it will always be, always be system two. But if you're just trying to, uh, 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 trying to uh, uh, sort of answer a question which appears to be obvious, um, that's where your system one, the instinctive thinking comes in, which many at times befools us. Uh, um, there are some examples given here, uh, but there's there's lots more uh, that we can we can understand. So this is this is one example from the book. Uh, uh, if you were to uh, compare the lengths uh, of the two yellow lines, which of the two is longer, uh, right? Uh, uh, the instinctive answer uh, could be wrong. Either ways, if you say the line on top is longer because it's a 3D image, uh, you're making an assumption that this is 3D image. Uh, most of us might actually think uh, that the line on top is uh, is 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 longer for uh, uh, for a different reason as well, which is the system one uh, uh, response. But the system two response is well, if it's 2D, the two lines are of the same length. If it's 3D, then certainly. Uh, you can uh, you can argue that uh, that the that the system one response of the top line being longer is correct um, and and this is where again uh, just an assumption uh, of whether this is 2D or 3D itself is something that our mind tends to make uh, in most cases uh, even after making that assumption or without making that assumption you would call out the top line to be longer than the bottom line uh, that's one example another one given in the book was about um, about the question on the right hand side that if a, if a bat and ball together cost 110 rupees and the bat costs 100 rupees more than the ball then what is the cost of the ball um, right it's quite interesting that uh, that most uh, most people give an instinctive answer of 100 rupees being the price of the bat uh, and 10 rupees being the price of the ball, uh, because our mind uh, sort of uh, gives us uh, uh, that as a very, a very appealing answer, although it is a completely wrong answer. Uh, the correct answer requires you to take a pause, look at the data points, observe, calculate the answer, revalidate, and then conclude that in fact the answer is rupees 5 and 105, not 10 and 110. Um, right, and that's uh, that's that's a very very good example of how uh, simple data-based interpretation uh, becomes uh, incorrect, even though very appealing uh, to our human mind. Now, how does all of this uh, apply to investing world? Um, there's some very interesting charts I'll take you through, um, uh, and uh, and hope you'll enjoy this next ten minutes of uh, uh, going through the exhibits. So compare this first one. Um, this is Tata Steel's share price chart uh, for about a year and a half long period compared to Titan. Titan is the dotted line. Tata Steel is the solid line. Uh, Tata Steel's share price return during this period is four times more than Titan's return, right? 440% versus 106%. This is how these two share prices from the same Tata group uh, played out in front of us uh, uh, a couple of years ago. And if somebody were to ask you, basis this chart, right? And they, many people will call this long-term, uh, right? Which is one and a half years. Uh, it's, it's pretty long and uh, over a long term, uh, uh, if somebody had the option of investing in the two companies and they chose Titan over Tata Steel, 
um, uh, they'll uh, they look at this chart and say that the decision was incorrect, the decision was wrong, um, when actually uh, that conclusion is just a system one thinking, uh, because you're not looking at the underlying drivers of the share price, you are just looking at the share price as an outcome, right? What are the underlying drivers of the share price? It's fundamentals, it's not the share price itself, um, and what happened to fundamentals if anybody had tried to ask that question sitting in FY20 or FY21 or even FY22, this is how the fundamentals of the two companies would have come across to that investor. And uh, the deltas are pretty huge, pretty significant. Not only does the sales growth of Titan pretty consistently beat that of Tata Steel, uh, the return on capital employed of Tata Steel is actually below cost of capital pretty consistently, and that of Titan is three times higher than Tata Steel's return on capital employed. The debt of debt to equity obviously is poles apart. Uh, Titan is nearly debt free, uh, and Tata Steel has been uh, has been a, 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 a sort of very very leveraged business. And uh, that then translates into EPS growth and free cash flows in rupees billion. There's actually no positive free cash flow of Tata Steel barring one year, consistently negative despite the size, despite the maturity of the business, so on and so forth. And on the other hand, Titan has positive and pretty fast growing free cash flows uh, across the 10 year period, right? If you were to look at this table and then conclude which of the two investments would have been the correct decision, you would have perhaps made the right decision of investing in uh, in Titan rather than Tata Steel as a long-term investor, uh, because this is what the two share prices did over the longer term, right? Uh, Titan was twice as much CAGR in the share price as Tata Steel over a longer term. Uh, whether you take three years, five years, 10 years, uh, you will arrive at the same conclusion, which is uh, completely reverse of what you would have concluded basis, basis that uh, uh, gap in between these two dotted lines where Titan uh, uh, underperformed versus Tata Steel by a one is to four um, uh, 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 gap, right? Uh, now, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, probably one of every investor's favorite topic, price to earnings multiple and, uh, and how to interpret it. So here are two charts. Now look at those those two charts in the following manner, right? Uh, so let me let me try to annotate, right? So if you look at this period of Titan's PE multiple, right? There is a three times jump in Titan's price to earnings, and that then is followed by this period of a significant correction, halving of PE multiple for Titan, right? So that's what has happened to Titan's PE. It jumped up by three times and then it halved. I'm sure many investors would say that when it was jumping up, you should uh, have stayed invested in Titan. And when it was coming down, you should have probably not been invested with Titan, right? So that's that's one set of observations. And we'll come to the question and the system on system two in a minute. On the contrary, look at Tata Steel's PE multiple. It's single digits for most of the times. Not only is it single digits, it's price to earnings declined by about 50% over the same time period when Titan's price to earnings went up by 200%, right? And Tata Steel's price to earnings then halved, uh, sorry, doubled uh, uh, over the last couple of years, right? From about five times, it went to 10 times, uh, or three times, it went to six times, something like that. Uh, and hence, it would appear that it's great to stay invested in Tata Steel uh, during the time of PE doubling. And it's great to stay out of Tata Steel during the times of uh, PE halving, right? Uh, so that's that's one way to look at these charts, uh, and uh, then asking the question uh, about which of the two stocks is uh, 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 more expensive than the other. Uh, the system one and system two responses will be 
very, very different as you can read in the text on the left. Now, here is how those system one and system two responses led to completely different outcomes. If system two said that, look, trailing 12 months, price to earnings does not make sense during a volatile period of profit after tax development or evolution, right? So what was volatile about the earnings over the last three years? At a time when Russia-Ukraine war was playing out, uh, Titan, uh, uh, sorry, Tata Steel benefited from commodity price shooting up into the sky as a commodity producer. That was not a sustainable increase in margins. That was not a sustainable increase in revenues. And that, as a result, was not a sustainable increase in profit after tax. Um, and hence, that caused an aberration in the price to earnings multiples for Titan, which in the chart at the bottom, if instead of trailing PE, you try to normalize it. Now, one way to normalize is look at one year forward PE. Uh, or there could be other ways to normalize the trailing 12-month earnings, uh, you'll notice that the solid line is far more a system two thinking outcome than the dotted line, which just is a system one thinking outcome, um, right? And the same thing played out for Titan as well, um, where the dotted line, it shot into the sky when the solid line, which is forward price to earnings multiple, it didn't move up meaningfully. What's even more important is that uh, how the share price behaved was completely different from how the price to earnings multiples were behaving. When Titan's price to earnings halved, its share price wasn't halving. Its share price went up by 60% in the last couple of years. And when Tata Steel's price to earnings doubled, its share price wasn't doubling. Its share price was down 20% between October 21 to March 23, right? That's how uh, uh, big an illusion a trailing price to earnings multiple can create at a time like this, where the earnings is not representative of normalized fundamentals, and if you were to just take a call as an investor based on price to earnings multiples going up and down, you might make an intuitive decision, which is an incorrect decision, that look, if Titan's PE is halving, certainly its share price must be collapsing. And hence, let's stay away from it. And if Tata Steel's PE is doubling, certainly its share price must be going up, which are actually completely reverse of what actually happened uh, to these two companies' uh, share prices. Now, uh, sorry, let me try to remove these bubbles. Okay. Right. Now, here's another um, illusion that gets created in front of us as equity investors, particularly if you, if you keep looking at the price to earnings multiple as a, as a big input into your decision-making process. This is Page Industries, and uh, I'm showing you a segment, and in a minute, I'll zoom out of it and show you uh, uh, a bigger picture, System 2 picture. This is System 1 observation. The price to earnings one year forward of Page went up by 70%. The share price also doubled, during the during the 2014-15 period, right? So that's that's this piece that I'm talking about. The price to earnings is going up, share price is doubling, um, and all hunky dory. You you as an investor should have been invested in in Page, and then came a good one and a half year period where its share price fell by five percent and probably underperformed many other investment opportunities. That's a one and a half year long period of 5% fall in the share price, which when computed in price to earnings multiple terms, it's a 30% decrease in price to earnings. Now, the 60 times PE multiple peak here 
is an all time high pe multiple for page industries right and hence when you look at this sort of a two and a half year chart in totality you would say that look uh, uh, the all time high pe multiple is perhaps the reason why in the in the second half of this two and a half year period page delivered a weak share price performance right that would be the system one conclusion how does system two think about it this is the first level of system two thinking not the complete one i'll come to the complete one in a minute the first level of system two thinking is that look there's is some reason why the price to earnings multiple of page keeps going up on a long term basis pretty consistently and these all time high levels they are achieved followed by a little bit of correction then again all time high correction all time high correction page keeps uh, making new all time highs in pes it has done that for the last 14 years pretty consistently and then your system 1 slash system 2 overlap might then say that look um, well uh, certainly not the 2015 all time high pe of 60 times was was expensive but but probably the 70 80 times pe multiple today is all time high it factors in a lot more than what it used to factor in a decade ago in terms of the longevity the quality of the business the strength of the business a lot of the positive stuff is getting built into the price basis this chart right that would be the conclusion but that again is system 1 because system 2 will say well uh, share price follows free cash flows can we instead of looking at price to earnings which is the chart on top that i showed you in the previous slide also compare it with price to free cash flows now free cash flows obviously tend to be very volatile when you look at one year uh, versus another year so what we've done is we've sort of added up three years of free cash flow so that we normalize the the reported numbers and then we've rolled it forward like this so when you do three years trailing free cash flow cumulative the price to free cash flow of page did not go up instead it went down despite the fact that the price to earnings multiple it went up three times from 20x to 60 70x right now this requires a bit of deeper thinking about why is this happening because this is not intuitive if you go deeper you'll realize that let's say during the period where between 2011 and 2015 page went through the maximum price to earnings expansion if you take a deeper look you'll realize the number of pieces produced per unit labor in jockey's case it went up at a cagr of 6% that's productivity gain which is not captured in the price to earnings but is captured into price to free cash flow right uh, in effect asset turns will significantly go up remember page is a, a relatively more capital heavy business where they have in house manufacturing so all the plant and machinery required to manufacture at scale in a way is on their books right and productivity per unit labor or productivity per machine increasing at a volume cagr of 6% obviously talks about asset turns expanding and if that is happening because of systems processes getting upgraded tech investments automation being part of the uh, dna of this firm then certainly its free cash flows will compound at a rate higher than earnings and if free cash flows do compound at a rate higher than earnings then price to earnings has a numerator and denominator mismatch where numerator is pulled up by free cash flows and denominator is pulled up by earnings and the two numbers they are not in sync 
for 99% of the businesses in on the stock market, these two numbers would be in sync. Earnings and free cash flows would broadly uh, progress at this at similar level. Capital efficiency doesn't improve structurally for many businesses. For very few businesses, it does improve structurally. For this one, it has, right? And appreciation of that is important because it's not as if the reinvestment rate dropped for page between 2010 and 2015 when the price to earnings multiple expanded without any increase in price to free cash flow the reinvestment rates did not drop the capital intensity did not change the capital efficiency changed and these are uh, again system 2 level thinking which uh, which you need to do otherwise uh, you'll you'll call many many of the investment decisions in a wrong way now this is, uh, uh, this is a little less deeper subject than the previous few slides on price to free cash flow, price to earnings. This is a chart of DV's labs, right? Again, one of our larger exposures in not just CCP, but many other Marcellus portfolios. Uh, DV's lab has undergone a nearly 40 to 50% drawdown in its share price very recently. Right, so let me annotate and highlight which drawdown I'm talking about when. Um, so this is the drawdown that DV's lab has uh, undergone in the more recent past. When you look at this share price chart, it appears that this recent drawdown is far greater than the preceding drawdowns that DV's lab underwent over the last two decades. Right. But that's actually a very incorrect observation if you were to say that the more recent drawdown is far greater than the historical drawdowns because these are compounders. When the share price compounds for any compounder, whether it be a CCP compounder or any other compounding stock or an asset, then um, uh, it's better to actually reflect on the drawdowns using a using a chart which is uh, uh, which is a lot more logarithmic than uh, just the normal share price chart right so hang on let me just yeah um and this is the log chart of the same devise lab share price chart which you saw on the previous slide right so the time period is the same the stock is the same the share price is the same just that on the vertical axis, in the previous slide, you had the typical share price chart that you'll find on Bloomberg or Google Finance or on your money control app, etc. And this is the logarithmic chart. In this logarithmic chart, you will conclude pretty easily that the more recent drawdown, the more recent drawdown is very similar or probably smaller than historical drawdowns that pay, uh, DV's lab has uh, witnessed, right? And the more and the faster the share price has compounded in the past, the bigger this illusion becomes. The slower the share price has compounded in the past, the smaller the illusion becomes, right? So this is an example of an even faster share price compounding. This is Bajaj Finance. Obviously, Bajaj Finance's stock has compounded at a far stronger pace than, uh, than DV's, and hence this chart becomes even, in, even more interesting on this particular illusion, right? Where you would say that, look, these all these drawdowns that have been highlighted in the last four or five years for Bajaj Finance are far greater than the experience of this stock's share price uh, prior to 2015, right? Prior to 2015, it actually looks very, very smooth. It's absolutely smooth, pretty much like a straight line, right? The moment you do a logarithmic uh, conversion of the same time period, same stock, this is how it looks, right? Uh, now again, it might be it might be very obvious to to maybe the 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 statisticians, the mathematicians listening to this, but most investors we've found 
this not to be so obvious. Um, Bajaj Finance's recent drawdowns are not higher than what they experienced in 2013, in 2010, 11, etc. In fact, that straight line that you saw on the previous chart included the global financial crisis, where obviously Bajaj Finance was a very different captive auto insure, um, auto uh, uh, financing business uh, previously, and it underwent a 90% uh, correction uh, because it was in, in 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 deep trouble on the balance sheet side at that time. Uh, and that 90% share price correction, interestingly, uh, during the global financial crisis, was not even visible in the normal share price chart. Right? You can't see that 90% correction here anywhere. It is absolutely smooth. Right? So that's, uh, that's something worth pointing out when you look at any chart, whether it be fund performance, share price performance, etc. Um, and uh, uh, this is an example of a non-compounder. This is Castrol. It hasn't compounded at a very strong pace. And hence, this is the normal share price chart, and the drawdowns look very similar when you convert it into a log chart. Um, again, the slower the pace of compounding, the closer the real share price chart is to the log chart, and the faster the pace of compounding, the more system one versus system two gap widens um, in your thinking, right? Uh, so that's, uh, that's something worth uh, remembering. And this is a final illusion that I think many of our investors in CCP and in many of Marcellus's funds are going through right now as we speak. This is the experience if you invested in a CCP, let's say, in middle of 2021. This is exactly what you would have experienced if you had invested in, let's say, HDFC Bank or Asian Pains in um, about February, March, 2008. March, 2008, if you entered into HDFC Bank, about a year later, you were down 30% or probably 50%. Asian Paints, if you entered in March 08, a year later in March 09, you would be down 30, 40%, right? So that's the experience that a draw, drawdown of a year can have, uh, right, for an investor. Next comes the billion dollar, million dollar, trillion dollar question, which is that if I have a five year or a three year or a seven year horizon, whatever time period you choose as long term, if I have, let's say, a five year horizon, I've already been through one year or a one, a, one and a half year of minus 20, minus 30, minus 50 in the case of HDFC Bank, uh, sitting in March 2009, having invested in March 2008, you're already down 50%. And then for your investment made in March 08 to have compounded at 20% over a five year period, you need the last three years out of the five years to compound at a very, very healthy pace. I think the answer will be if you back calculate 40, 50, 60% or something like that. And only then will your five-year block having started in March 08 end, let's say in March 13, at 20%. It appears unreal. It appears difficult when you use your system one thinking. But the moment you say that, look, uh, Share prices are driven by fundamentals. Last one year disconnect or one and a half year disconnect between share prices and fundamentals will reverse the moment you zoom out, your system to response will be very different to the same question which has been asked at the moment. At, at the bottom, right? So the question at the bottom is, from a share price return of minus 30 or minus 50 after the first 12 months, can the investor still achieve her expectations of 20% plus compounding from her investment over a five-year period, right? Again, March 08 being the starting point, not from March 09. From March 09, it's easy to answer. You're at the bottom of the market, 
um, if you uh, have that foresight, uh, and hence compounding after a drawdown is going to be healthy. But what about your starting point? After a drawdown, can you actually catch up so much that from March 08 onwards itself, you will compound at a healthy pace? And here are the two responses. System one would say no. System two will say, well, maybe yes. Um, this is the real experience. The recovery did happen for everything in the stock market, but the recovery was far sharper, quicker, and longer for businesses where fundamentals kept compounding during the drawdown at a very healthy pace. Starting in March 08, ending in March 13, HDFC Bank compounded at around 20%. And starting in March 08 and ending in March 13, Asian paints compounded at more than 30%. Nifty didn't do that. 95% of the listed universe didn't do that. Why? Because not every business was compounding fundamentals at a healthy rate of 20, 25, 30%. These two businesses were. And that drove their share price recovery, where if you notice, 2009, 10, 11, the slope of the chart was greater than the slope of the down, uh, the, the, the drawdown because the recovery was very sharp and it sustained until share prices caught up with fundamentals, right? Uh, that's typically the long-term phenomenon. And hence, now linking back to uh, where we started this webinar, we can see the fundamentals of our portfolio companies evolving at a very healthy run rate, compounding in a very consistent and healthy manner. I know many of our uh, uh, investors have, uh, have told us in our uh, last 12 months of interaction that, that share prices uh, compound well, fundamentals don't, but the share prices are driven by fundamentals and hence uh, it's important to actually use your system two thinking and, uh, and look at the drivers of the share prices to, to derive whether, uh, whether after a drawdown, like what we've seen in the last 12 or 18 months, uh, you can expect your investment, uh, regardless of when it was made, to compound at the same rate as the share price or not, uh, right? And this is not, just, uh, uh, this is not just the 2008 experience. Uh, you can consider this as an experience you can analyze for any any uh, uh, share price drawdown followed by a recovery. Uh, now, uh, very quickly, just summarizing as a result, how we look at uh, uh, look at various factors, various attributes of our portfolio. So we promise to our clients, uh, we'll, uh, we'll invest in long-term oriented uh, businesses, long-term oriented consistent compounding fundamentals, not short-term. We'll make long-term oriented calls, whether it is related to rebalancing or churn or exit, uh, not short-term. And we'll deliver healthy returns in the long-term, not short-term. That's exactly what uh, what we've been, uh, we've been uh, 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 doing in terms of fundamentals of the companies that we pick up. And that's exactly how we expect the share prices and portfolio performances uh, to, to play out. Um, these are some of the examples of uh, short-term versus long-term uh, thinking that can be observed from how we have approached certain situations in the last 12 to 18 months uh, versus uh, what we don't want to do, even if it sounds attractive. So for instance, um, if it sounds attractive, uh, sorry, once again, um, for instance, if it sounds attractive to say that, look, uh, uh, COVID has come, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty around us. Uh, let's, uh, let's exit from a Bajaj Finance as an unsecured lender in 2020 when the share price is falling, put a stop loss, uh, reduce our exposure to a falling knife rather than trying to catch a falling knife, so on and so forth. We just say, well, falling knife in all our analogies, but we are investing in a business which is uh, not likely to see significant fundamental erosion, um, uh, and hence the decision that we made. Uh, FY22, when you look at free cash flows, the knee-jerk reaction, the system one thinking, will be that, look, uh, uh, free cash flows are negative. 
is something bad probably that is likely to happen on the share price because uh, finance 101 talk, teaches us that share prices is, is uh, driven by free cash flows and here free cash flows in fy22 for the portfolio have had a negative year on year um, but that's actually incorrect because in most of those cases these are accelerated capital allocation decisions which are likely to bear a lot of fruit uh, in future which which is something that we've already started seeing and will accelerate going forward the impact of russia ukraine war the share price fall due to a uh, new entrant threat, uh, particularly in the case of Dr. Lal Path Labs, uh, 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 the, the impact of on, on DV's labs from uh, Molnupiravir revenues going away, so on and so forth. Many of those uh, uh, situations required um, us to choose between system one versus system two reactions. Uh, we've always tried to do system two more around long term. Uh, and uh, and we expect to see the outcome, the result of that in the longer term uh, for our portfolio companies. Uh, finally, for valuations, I showed you a few price to earnings multiple charts. Uh, internally at Marcellus, we don't follow price to earnings as a way uh, to derive our decisions or to arrive at decisions. Uh, we use DCF. Uh, discounted cash flow for uh, many of you are actually interested. Um, uh, you can you can go through. Michael Morbusin's book, uh, Expectations Investing, in which he very clearly articulates how to use a DCF, uh, discounted cash flow model, to, uh, to compute the fair value of any business or to back calculate the implied fundamental progression in the current share price of any stock. Right. So for instance, a uh, very simple exercise, and maybe in subsequent webinars, we can, uh, we can take you through some of the case studies here. A very simple exercise. If you look at uh, uh, a business with 100 rupees of free cash flows today, assume a 20% or 22% compounding, uh, apply a 12% discount rate, um, and then see in the current price to free cash flow multiple, how many years of compounding is implicit before you call uh, destruction of the competitive advantage or destruction of the business strength for that business, what you'll find out for a typical Marcellus portfolio company, the, the number of such years uh, built into the share prices of these stocks at the moment will be between mid single digit to high single digit number of years. Now, for the kind of companies that we are invested in, if the share price is factoring in five, seven, eight years of future only and thereafter complete disruption, no fade period, only terminal growth, et cetera. That's where we see the undervaluation. That's a, that's a rough and ready uh, way to approach undervaluation slash overvaluation, but a more precise one which we follow internally is to compute how many years of uh, longevity of a certain rate of free cash flow compounding we see for a business and hence what's the gap margin of safety between intrinsic value and fair value. I think that's uh, that's that's far more system two type of thinking than system one, and um, and 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 basis uh, whatever we discussed in the last forty five minutes. I think uh, 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 you can you can understand the difference between system one and system two. So I'll stop there. Uh, promote the maybe we can take uh, questions that have come to us so far. Yeah, sure. Just uh, just to repeat. Uh... Uh, clients who are interested in asking questions, uh, you can type in your question in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and we have about half an hour, 45 minutes to take as many as possible. Uh, so feel free to uh, get those in. So we have a few in already. I think there's uh, one basic question, and I can understand why this can be an important question for a number of clients, because they are not familiar with many of these uh, finance terms because we lay a lot of emphasis on free cash flow, both in terms of understanding the quality of the business, as well as uh, informing ourselves about what the business is worth. Uh, Rakshit, if you can spend some time helping our clients understand what is free cash flow, what does it mean in uh, simple English, um, and how do you compute it from, uh, from the available um, reported numbers uh, from the company right um so look think of it like this uh, um, for any business uh, what is important is two things one the business should throw out profits and cash 
at a point in time. But the second piece is that the business should also grow. And only then can investors derive the benefits of that growth, right? If you are in long-term growth-oriented uh, uh, equity investing. Now, uh, ability to throw out cash at a point in time is defined by the pricing power, the operating efficiency, and hence from revenue down to profit after tax for a business in a particular year, right? Obviously, a, a, a cash generative business means all the profit after tax is also converted into operating cash flow, um, uh, 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 one is to one. Now, that's the point in time profits, which is in the denominator of a PE multiple, right? Now, in order to grow the business, the growth has to be funded by some investments. So after a business has generated profit, so let's say, take a simple example. Uh, let's say Devain is running a business this year, which generates a revenue of 1,000 rupees and profit of 100 rupees, right? For the 1,000 rupee revenue to keep growing in future, Devain will have to reinvest in new factories, reinvest in maybe new machines, reinvest in technology, or maybe reinvest in uh, 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 incremental raw material purchases, which will drive future revenue growth, so on and so forth, right? Uh, if Devin doesn't do that reinvestment, today's 1,000 might not grow to, say, 2,000 and 3,000 in the years to come. But once Devin makes that investment into a factory, into... Uh, say machines into working capital, etc. He will reduce the hundred rupee profit after tax by that investment to achieve at the free cash flow of the business for that year. Now, let's say you needed to invest fifty rupees to build a new plant, which will generate revenues for you three years down the line. What Devain's business will then look like is revenues of 1,000, profits of 100, and free cash flow of 50. Because out of the 100, 50 was reinvested to grow the business into the future. So today, the free cash flow is only 50. It is not 100. Right? Now, if Devain doesn't make this 50 rupees of investment, his 100 won't grow. If Devain does make this 50 rupees of investment, then only he can expect the 100 to go to 200 and 300 and 400. The fair value of a business is nothing other than present value of all expected future free cash flows. It is not the present value of all expected future profits. Because remember, profits don't have the power to grow the business. So, and profits is not what you're taking back home. As an investor, what you're taking back home is free cash flow. After having reinvested part of the profits to deliver growth. If those reinvestments um, are very poor in quality, your free cash flows, which you take back home, will be very, very low. And if your reinvestments are high quality, not only will you uh, grow your profits at a very healthy pace, if you actually improve your capital efficiency, your free cash flow might actually grow at a faster pace. So the growth in 50 rupees might be faster than the growth in 100 rupees. Right? So concept number one, free cash flow is what the investor takes back home not profits because free cash flows are netted of the reinvestment rates. Secondly, if the reinvestment of profits is efficient, then you can derive growth. And if the efficiency increases over a period of time, free cash flow growth can actually be higher than profit growth. And this is what you need to be conscious of when you look at the highest quality businesses. 
highest quality businesses might not necessary but they might generate high free cash flow at a point in time drive great profit growth through reinvestment and improve capital efficiency to grow free cash flows at a faster pace than profits over the longer term and sustain this engine for a much longer time period uh, now for a typical business let's say an hdfc bank for an hdfc bank last 15 years or 10 years price to earnings has been broadly sort of unchanged and you don't need to worry about free cash flows because in this case actually it's a bank all of the earnings get reinvested back right and whatever little bit a bank might be throwing off as free cash flows uh, you don't see capital efficiency it's not investment into factories at all uh, in a structural way uh, for many of the weaker quality businesses free cash flows might actually be negative and hence just being very happy about uh, profits being healthy and price to earnings being low doesn't matter right we gave you the tata steel example very good example when you look at their fundamentals right look at these fundamentals tata steel has had a negative free cash flow consistently despite being a matured business and a consistently negative free cash flow will certainly not fuel any um, uh, 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 sort of value creation over a longer period of time because this weak free cash flow actually is not because they are investing heavily to drive growth growth rate itself is pretty weak return on capital employed is below cost of capital so the reinvestments are actually not productive basis this data and hence an investment into such a business over the longer term will deliver the share price chart the solid line at the bottom very different from the experience of the dotted line because in the dotted line your free cash flows which are a reflection of how the capital in reinvestments have worked the return on capital employed being high on reinvested capital means that the free cash flows are firing away at a very healthy pace and hence the chart at the bottom for a stock typically a matured company particularly right we are not talking about uh, say small caps where uh, they are nowhere close to maturity and free cash flows are not existent at the moment because it's in a heavy reinvestment mode we're talking about matured businesses the chart at the bottom is far more important than the chart at the top um, in terms of free cash flows versus earnings great um so there's a question about how uh, you know it is very clear that on all parameters ccp companies are doing better than that of the nifty yet uh, if uh, if the share price experience has been different does that suggest that uh, at some stage uh, there was a, there was an excess valuation issue in fact i think they're pointing to this chart that's on the screen so the fact the dotted line had overshot the blue line does that my, uh, mean that in that period um, the fundamentals were disconnected with the share price in a different way that we are seeing today and hence this sort of uh, uh, period was just a correction of that excess well yes and no uh, both sides of the answer so was the dotted line higher than the solid line uh, with a bigger gap than in the past yes right because the dotted line was actually slightly behind the solid line for bulk of the last uh, say 6 7 8 years and in fy 21 22 it was ahead of the of the solid line Uh, so to that extent yes uh, you can say uh, certainly that it, it was more richly valued than what um, on the price to free cash flow basis uh, the portfolio was more richly valued than say 2016 or 2017 price to free cash flow that's correct but was it overvalued uh, no right because this correction of the dotted and the solid line convergence could have been a very gradual one or uh, 
it could have actually remained the same gap for a very long period of time. Ability to predict a correction like this over a 12 month period is more speculation if you were sitting in say December 21, Russia Ukraine war hadn't started, right? The PSU bank doubling of share prices, which we saw in October, November, December, there was no fundamental reason why you should have expected that uh, the, the money flowing from long equity to long bonds, uh, long tail equity to long tail bonds, variety of things that happened in the last 12 months, it would have been speculative to expect all of them and quantify them in December 21. So is the timing of the movement of dotted around the solid line, which is difficult and hence um, uh, uh, not easy to make those calls. But having said that, if you ask a slightly different question, was the portfolio and the constituent stocks, were they overvalued in March 2022, let's say? The answer is an emphatic no. Wherever we found those overvaluations, we either didn't hold those stocks in the portfolio or we exited from those stocks, right? Uh, and 12 month of share price progression doesn't put a stamp on whether at a point in time 12 months ago, a share price was overvalued or undervalued, right? Uh, uh, very similar to, let's say, when you look at the page industries uh, price to free cash flow, uh, you'll see many instances right many instances where let's say the price to free cash flow went up from 32 times to 47 now somebody would have said well uh, 32 to 47 is overvaluation let's exit from page and that would have been a disastrous call because the share price kept going up even the price to free cash flow was up as long as the 47 the 67 the 39 all of these points as long as they were below intrinsic value it made a lot of sense to stay invested. And it did for Jockey, in uh, for Page in the last uh, sort of 14, 15 years, uh, right? Uh, for the longer time period perspective. Um, so, so answering that question as a result in a slightly different way, uh, do we think that uh, uh, an HDFC bank was overvalued in 2000? 20 or 2021, because of which the next two years, the share price didn't go anywhere. Do we think that uh, DV's lab was uh, overvalued, or Dr. Lal was overvalued about a year ago? No, uh, it was less undervalued. And that reduction in undervaluation was reflected in our position sizing. So DV's was actually a very small position size about a year ago, because of the dotted line going above the solid line, even though DVs was still undervalued, but we had cut down the position size. DVs was a far greater position size three years ago when we entered it into our portfolio. Uh, uh, and it was a much smaller position size about a year ago. And now we've doubled it because the dotted line has gone below the solid line. So on an absolute basis, the answer to the question is uh, no. There was no uh, sign of overvaluation on a relative basis. Yes, and we reflected uh, that piece in our position sizing. Great. Um, in terms of, uh, there's a very basic fundamental question on uh, the use of log scale to to show the stock price movements. Um, I think. Uh, you know, worth explaining why sometimes when the range of numbers is large, such as stocks which have a very long compounding, stock prices which have gone up from, you know, like Bajaj Finance from next to nothing to almost 8,000, uh, the changes are not representative on a normal scale and the use of log scale. Right. So, um, I mean, quick conceptual revision. Uh, if you remember, the, the, the we used to be taught in school, at least uh, I remember I used to be taught in school, the difference between simple compounding, sorry, simple interest and compound interest, right? So the simple interest means the principle doesn't change. On a principle of 100, every year you get 10% simple interest. So the 100 goes to 110. The next year, 110 goes to 120 because the 10% is being earned on the same principle. 
And the compound interest part is that the principal keeps going up itself, uh, which means 100 goes to 110. The next year, 10% is not on 100, it's on 110. And hence, uh, second year's end result is 121 uh, rather than 120. Third year is 133 uh, 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 rather than 130. Fourth year is uh, uh, higher, so on and so forth, right? So if you just extend that uh, piece into share price charts, share price charts where the stock compounds every year, let's say, at a healthy pace, those share price charts will look like exponential curves, not linear straight line curves upwards. They will look like exponential curves. And Bajaj Finance is a very good example of showing that exponential curve, right? Uh, so, so, so let me try to annotate if I can. Um, this is how Bajaj Finance's share price chart has exponentially gone up. Linear would have been straight line up, right? Exponential is something like this, right? Now, uh, if it's an exponential curve because of compounding, compounding makes it exponential, then in the more recent periods, after the share price has gone up, in the more recent period, even a 10% correction, let's say from 8,000 coming down to 7,000, that's only 1,000 rupee correction on a base of 8,000, right? Which is nothing more than 12, 13%. Even a uh, 12 13 percent correction will look far bigger than let's say if the share price had actually fallen from 2000 to 1000 a 2000 to 1000 quantum wise is a thousand rupee correction but percentage wise it's a 50 percent correction right so today's 10 percent correction in a bajaj finance looks very similar in this chart to Historical 50% correction. Or let me put it in another way. Today's 10% correction in Bajaj Finance looks very big compared to a 10% correction previously, which was a very small correction. Right? So this concept, if you don't bear in mind for a compounder, and remember, most share prices in the stock market are not compounders, right? Uh, the example that, that I gave you about Castrol is a perfect example of share price, which is not a compounder. If the share price is not a compounder, then log and normal will look very similar. But if the share price is a compounder, then normal and log will look very different. And hence, whether you look at your portfolio performance as well, right? Over a five-year period, uh, if you say, well, I invested 50 lakhs, it went up to, let's say, one crore. Every one lakh erosion on a base of 50 lakhs versus a one lakh erosion on a base of one crore needs to bear this piece in mind when you're looking at the compounding. Percentages are far more important than absolute numbers. And that's, uh, that's something worth bearing in mind. Great. Then it comes to the big point in terms of uh, timing. Um, so clients are saying, um, you know, given the current situation, um, what's our take on the equity market? Do you recommend uh, we start deploying capital um, and so on? Um, how should you? How should we guide them, Rakshit? Yeah. So again, I, I think the answer has to come from uh, the choice of long term versus short term. Um, if you talk about okay, so let me go back to. this piece right this is where you are actually right um what should you be doing now it just so happened that in this chart march 2009 was the bottom it could have been that september 2009 or march 2010 was the bottom and the share price fell a lot more before it started recovering right which is the uncertainty sitting in march 2009 and looking at this chart 
right? That's the uncertainty that uh, we face when we try to answer this question in a precise manner. But what is the certainty or what is the higher conviction piece in trying to answer this question? The higher conviction piece is that no matter whether you entered in March 06 or 07 or 08 or 09, today we are uh, sitting on a disconnect jaw opening between fundamentals and share prices, that jaw opening will certainly shut at some point in the future. It could be next month onwards, it could be three months onwards, could be six months later, but that jaw opening will not sustain and not increase further forever. The jaw opening will reverse, it will shut down. Will it shut down over a five-year period? Most certainly, yes. No guarantees, but most certainly, yes. Right? If you are in a 1930s type of a 10-year bear run, then the jaw, the jaw that is open might actually shut down after many years. But that's sort of one in a 100-year event. Uh, we don't see any reason why we should expect this to be a one in a 100-year event. But barring those kinds of one in a 100-year uh, uh, probabilities, the jaw opening will shut down if you have a longer time horizon. And the moment you have a longer time horizon, then the answer becomes, regardless of whether there is another 5% fall before the recovery starts or whether today was the day when the recovery started, um, regardless of those two scenarios, you should be investing today. If you like this philosophy of investing, and if you uh, are convinced uh, about the stock picking basis, the fundamentals of the companies here, right? Uh, so, so yeah, so long answer, but uh, uh, in short, yes, it's a very good time to invest. Right, so this is also a question on uh, timing, given the opportunities uh, that these charts show that you can actually exit and uh, um, and get back in. Um, does it encourage, uh, does it justify a profit booking sort of behavior? Um, I know what, what your answer is going to be. I mean, it does seem tempting when you look at these charts because these are all hindsight, right? These are all looking back. Uh, if somebody gave you a chart for the future, obviously you should do it. We should also do it. Um, the fact that um, you know we have failed to do it terribly uh, in our earlier years has ensured that we don't attempt doing it. But um, yes, the charts do suggest that there is a way to make money only if you know that this is the best time to sell or this is the best time to buy. Anything you'd like to add, uh, Rakshit? No, you you uh, you uh, you've uh, hit the nail on the head. Promote uh, uh, in every historical chart. Uh, you, you are in the position of God because only God knew how the chart will play out into the future. And when you're looking at a historical chart, you know how it played out in future once you were sitting at various timestamps on the horizontal axis here. Uh, in the position of God, with a hand of God on the head, yes, we do believe there's, uh, there's logic and timing, but uh, we are also conscious of the fact that we don't have hand of God on the head. And hence, uh, we don't try to time. Right. So, a uh, few people have asked uh, if we can share our intrinsic value estimates on the portfolio companies. Um, I would just warn about uh, intrinsic values. The DCF, while uh, a, a very powerful tool in terms of informing ourselves of the worth of these companies, uh, is not necessarily an exact science. Remember, it's subject to a lot of errors in terms of forecasting, discount rates, so on and so forth, which is why Rakshit mentioned uh, the book Expectations Investing by Michael Mobosin, which uh, instead uh, flips it on its head and suggests that if you were to do um, an implied uh, DCF, what is the longevity of the competitive advantage period in turn, effectively the period in which you expect the business to generate returns on capital in excess of cost of capital before it starts getting competed away um, is a better way to inform yourself 
about whether the stock is overvalued or undervalued. I think Rakshit mentioned for most of our companies, um, that period of competitive advantage uh, is somewhere between five and 10 years as implied by the current stock prices. And the way we give ourselves the comfort that these companies are still undervalued is uh, given our understanding of these businesses, their modes, the capital allocation, the management strengths and so on. We tend to believe that their competitive advantages will sustain far longer than, than the five to 10 years uh, with a significant margin of safety. And therefore, um, we, we believe that they are undervalued. Uh, we can publish intrinsic values, but you know they're as good as anybody's guess uh, or, or rather subject to uh, many errors. And, and we, we wouldn't recommend you give too much importance to absolute estimates of intrinsic values either. Uh, Rakshit, any better way to help uh, our clients understand this? Yeah, I mean, um, I'll, I'll maybe try to uh, put it into a, a bit of an analogy-oriented way. Um, so think of it like this. Uh, when, you, uh, when you are buying any asset, you are trying to answer two questions. One, is the asset undervalued or overvalued? That's the absolute call that you should take, right? And the second is between two undervalued assets, which one should I buy more of, right? If you look at those two as mutually exclusive decisions, then life becomes a little easier in this slightly subjective way of arriving at fair values. Right. So the way we do it is we say that, look, uh, first and foremost, let's back calculate what is built into the price. To say that whether the stock is undervalued or not, in a way, margin of safety should be positive. Right. That call of a positive margin of safety prevailing when you invest is a mutually exclusive call compared to which of the positive margin of safety stocks should you buy more of in your portfolio, right? If you segregate the two, then life becomes easy. The way we do it is after we have arrived at a bunch of stocks in our coverage universe, which all have positive margin of safety, we then say, okay, let's look at the qualitative aspects of capital allocation, management quality, pricing power, and compare these qualitative aspects against each other across the coverage universe of stocks. Pick up the top 14, 15, 13 stocks out of that positive margin of safety coverage universe. Basis, your assessment of those strengths around capital allocation, management quality, and pricing power. That's the thought process. Now, if we say the margin of safety on a particular stock is 40%, in reality, eventually we might be proven wrong by say 5, 10% up or down. The margin of safety might have been 30 or 50. It does not matter as long as we applied the same framework on all of those stocks, where two stocks, one with 40% margin of safety and one with, let's say, 50 we gave higher weight to 50% margin of safety and a lower weight to 40. Eventually, if our framework should have chosen a cost of capital of 12.5% instead of 12 or 11.5% instead of 12, it doesn't matter because we should still have bought the stock with greater margin of safety with a greater allocation in the portfolio, which we did. Right. So that's how, in a way, if you keep these two subjects mutually exclusive, uh, investing becomes far more uh, 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 scientific and probabilities of success increase. Right. I think we have time for one question, which is uh, I think it's an interesting question on Bajaj Finance, uh, particularly in relation to expectations investing. Um, given that Bajaj Finance's growth, uh, in terms of uh, loan book or AUM um, is still healthy at 27%, but much slower than what it had been reporting uh, over the years. Um, is, the, uh, uh, is the share price uh, uh, correction 
reflective of the fact that there is readjustment of expectations from the market in terms of this slowing growth and is this slowing growth a result of the larger size of bajaj finance itself given that um, you know now that market has been created by bajaj finance a lot of other retail banks are also uh, entering there's of course news of geo finance as well um, so one is the the effect on uh, on the valuation in terms of slowing growth and the second is why is the growth slowing uh, in the first place so a corollary to that question is also a compression in the yield given housing loans uh, which are low yielding uh, products within the bajaj finance portfolio have become a larger part so not only is the loan book growth slowing profit growth will be even lower if the yield also compresses and is is the market smart enough to uh, acknowledge that and hence hence the derating of the stock price correction right very good question i would say um so to begin with two parts two different ways to answer the last sentence is the market smart enough in the long term market is very very smart nobody should think that they know better than the market from a long term perspective in the short term market is not so smart in all the cases right in the short term share prices are a reflection of how the expectation of investors change in reaction to an event now this short term reaction many a times tends to be a system one reaction if i were to use the same framework that we used in this webinar for system 1 versus system 2 of daniel kahneman uh in the short term share price reactions could be system 1 reaction in the long term they usually are always system 2 reactions now what are the possible concerns that one can have on bajaj finance first and foremost the biggest concern this is a leveraged business all lenders are leveraged someone like an sbi is leveraged 21 times a kotak bank is leveraged five or six times and a bajaj finance i guess 10 times um all businesses are uh, 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 leveraged now i think bajaj finance is leverage is less than that uh in any leveraged business the moment you uh factor in a lending mistake the impact on equity erosion is very very high so let's take state bank of india as an example 21 times leverage 1 rupee shave off from their loan book will lead to a 5 rupee shave off equivalent from the equity for the same base let's say right because it's 20 times uh, 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 leverage uh, it's it's it uh, so a fifth of the book let me put it this way sorry a fifth of the book will get shaved off by 1% of mistake on the loan book right a fifth of the equity will get shaved off if 1% of the loans go bad that as the impact of 20 times leverage as a result the moment the market builds in uh, expectations around mistakes being made by a lender or probability of a mistake that could be made by a lender the share price reaction tends to be far sharper than it would be for let's say an fmcg company right because the fmcg company making a mistake in selling a product uh, will have a far smaller impact on the equity part uh, for the overall business's sustainability part than it would for a lender uh, the second uh, piece on a on a company like bajaj finances if the share price is implying let's say 25% compounding for the next 5 years or 10 years and then there is a change in the external environment because of which in the short term investors they react with system one thinking maybe to say that the longevity will probably be half of what it could have been without this event the event could be covid 
the event could be uh, any of these encircled events on this chart. And hence, the share price reaction will be reflective of changes in longevity period or the changes in rate of growth. Or, as I said, just the reaction that, look, this is a leveraged business. Uh, for, a, for a business which is five times leveraged or 20 times leveraged, the impact on equity erosion will be far greater than the impact from loan book erosion. Um, that's the reason why Bajaj Finance appears to be far more volatile. But that also gives you as an analyst, as an investor, a greater opportunity to benefit from these dislocations if you can figure out better than the short-term market uh, uh, impact of a probable event, right? And, uh, and that's what we did in 2020. That's what we did last year where we increased allocations every time. We were convinced that the event has got nothing to do with long-term impact on the fundamentals, but uh, uh, the market was uh, behaving in a, a different way. Now, coming to the point of ROE, uh, given housing finance expansion, so there are two, two, uh, two or three interesting points that are worth understanding here. Bajaj Finance was not in housing uh, home loans, uh, till about, say, uh, 10, 12 years ago. And today, a third of their book is home loans. Uh, home loans is hardly 13% ROE compared to the rest of the business, which is in the 20s of ROE. But still, the blended average ROE for Bajaj Finance has not reduced, which effectively means that home loan standalone is lower ROE than the rest of the business standalone. But the two together are actually a stronger way to grow business than any or either of the two individually, right? It increases the size of the canvas by cross-selling, upselling. It increases the tail of assets, the duration of assets uh, on the balance sheet, and hence uh, makes the engine far more robust, far stronger. If that can happen without compromising ROE, uh, uh, even better. Uh, and final piece, a 22% ROE coming down to 20, as long as it was expected in your understanding, and the 20% ROE is still higher than cost of capital, right? That shouldn't lead you to say that, look, Bajaj Finance is, is, uh, is, is probably going to get disrupted overnight. Um, how we see here instead is that through the cross-sell upsell franchise, they are actually uh, becoming less and less uh, uh, balance sheet oriented lender versus they were till say five years ago. So in the last five years, the loans per cross-sell customer have grown at 4% CAGR, but the profit per cross-sell customers has grown at 14% CAGR. And this is only because of fee income that they are earning on the cross-sell franchise. As you do more fintech-oriented services to your existing customers, uh, these are value-added services without having to expose your balance sheet incrementally for every rupee of profit growth. The profit growth actually becomes healthier. And then for the same uh, X percentage of profit growth, if you don't have to uh, uh, grow loan book at the same X run rate, in fact, it might be X minus 10 in this case, uh, it's a healthier way to grow. Uh, provided the opportunity size is big enough and you can sustain that for longer than what is built into the share price, you'll find a Bajaj Finance undervalued. Um, but that requires a call on the management team's capability, their discipline, uh, their capital allocation, uh, prudence, and uh, in even home loans, pricing power for a Bajaj Finance. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Rakshit. Thanks, Devin. Uh, that was fairly insightful. And thanks to all our clients to have dialed in. And uh, we'll hope to see you next month with the next uh, webinar. Thanks once again. Thank you. Thanks, Ramon. Thanks, everyone.